Hey guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we have Al Brooks. This is the uh, fourth time, actually, that he's been presenting on, on BMT. Uh, today, Al is going to talk about trading channels, and in particular, he wants to talk about when to swing and when to scalp within a channel, uh, how to manage stops within a channel, uh, how to trade strong, weak, uh, I'm sorry, how to trade strong, tight channels as well as weak, broad channels. Uh, like always, as you guys have questions, you can type them into the questions box and we'll do our best to get those answered. The webinar is being recorded. It will be posted on BMT in the usual spot sometime tomorrow. Uh, I will also send a link over to, uh, to Fletch at, uh, on Al Brooks' website and he can post a link uh, sometime tomorrow when that webinar is uploaded. At the end of this webinar, we are going to give away 10 copies of your choice of any of Al's uh, three new books. Uh, so stay tuned to the very end for those quiz questions. Uh, like always, I will be asking for your BMT username if you are the, uh, the person that has won a prize, and then that's how I will get a hold of you and get your contact information so that we can get that autographed book into your hands. So if you do not have a BMT uh, username, if you don't have an account on BMT, please create one now. It is free. All right, guys, give me one second, and I will be turning things over to Al. Hang on, please. Um, I'm hoping that you can now see my screen. Hi, this is Al Brooks, and I appreciate everybody being here. And I'd like to thank Mike for giving me the opportunity to speak. Mike, if uh, you do not see the screen, either send me an email or um, you know just uh, tell me, and uh, I'll do whatever I have to do to make it visible. Um, I've written a series of books on price action, and um, you know, I make very little money off the books. Wiley hates it when I say that, but that's the reality. Um, I wrote the books more for uh, personal satisfaction, um, and it was fun to write the books. You know, I, I speak all day long in my uh, chat room, and I enjoy um, becoming better and better at articulating what I do. I trade for myself. I take lots of trades all day long, and when I'm talking in the room, uh, I try to point out a uh, number of setups before um, uh, they happen. Anyway, the three books, one's on, on trends, the other's trading ranges, the other's reversals. Within the books, there are other things as well. In the trend book, there's a lot of information about basic price action reading. On the trading ranges, I talk about swinging, scalping, stops, and uh, money management. And in the reversals section, I talk a lot about uh, day trading, some about options, and um, an overall <clears throat> approach if you're uh, just starting out as a trader. Um, you know, what can the market? Let me hang on a second. Let me, okay, um, on my website, BrooksPriceAction.com, um, I provide the content, and there are some traders who uh, run the site, and uh, there are a lot of free articles I've written. I don't know, maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen articles for Futures Magazine. And I also post um, my reading, my bar by bar reading of um, the five minute e mini chart um, every every day. And uh, I'm sure there are several months of um, postings up there. And I believe there are traders who video um, the day the, the day sessions and uh, along with my audio commentary during the day. And I also have um, uh, real time uh, daily webinars. Uh, on a fee basis. Um, what can the market do? That's what price action is. Price action is the action of the market. Uh, the mar everyone already knows this. The market is in a cycle and it's always going from trends to trading ranges. And once it's in a trading range, it can break out in either direction and then the process starts over again with another trend. Trends can be strong. Uh, they can be uh, very big. Uh, let's talk about bull trends. 
They can be very big bull trend bars, a series of them, uh, very little overlap. The bar is opening near their lows, closing near their highs, and that's a breakout phase. The market's breaking out of something. You may not see what it's breaking out of, but if you look hard enough, you'll see. It's either breaking out of a trading range or breaking above a, uh, a trend line. It's breaking out of something. A trend can also be weak. There can be big uh, swings um, um, basically in the channel. Uh, so these are the two kinds of trends, a spike and a uh, channel. At least that's how I view the market. The market can also be in a trading range. When the trading range is small, you know, a few bars, five bars, ten bars, and um, it's likely that the trend will resume. Uh, traders call it a pullback. Uh, if the trading range is bigger and traders are, are not sure whether the trend will resume or whether the trend will reverse, I just refer to it as a trading range. Uh, an example of a trading range is a head and shoulders top. Uh, most head and shoulders tops break out in the direction of the trend and they uh, become triangles. Sometimes a head and shoulders top fails to break out in the direction of the trend. In other words, you fail to get the bull breakout and instead you get the bear breakout and then people call it a head and shoulders top. But most head and shoulders tops are really bull flags. Sometimes they fail to break out in the correct direction. Okay, so um, here's an example of the things that I'm talking about. Uh, if you start with the green um, boxes, trading ranges, markets going sideways. Um, at times it looks like it's going to go up. At other times it looks like it's going to go down. Um, the, uh, the probability of um, an upside breakout versus a downside breakout, for the most part, is 50-50. Uh, sometimes you have a very strong move, uh, these pink boxes. Uh, that's a breakout or a spike phase of a trend. Here's another big spike down. And after a spike, you start to get overlapping bars, bars with some pullbacks, a low below the low of the prior bar. You get some bear bars, uh, and you can draw lines above and below, and that's the channel phase. So you have a spike and a channel, and eventually a channel evolves into a trading range, and then the market can break out in either direction. Here you get a bull breakout of a trading range, and here you have another trading range, and you have a bear breakout. Over here, you have a, a bear spike, a trading range, a bear breakout, but it quickly reversed, um, so you have a failed breakout. And this is, um, the market just does this all day long, every time frame, uh, every market. Um, you know, you got a trading range, a breakout, and um, the breakout slows into a channel. The channel evolves into another trading range, and then the process begins again. Okay, um, I'm talking about channels, and first question, obvious one, is how do you draw channels? The red lines, for example, this one, I simply drew channels along uh, swing high. So I took a swing high here, I picked a swing high here. Uh, that would contain all the prior highs, and then I extended the line forward. And over here, the market broke above the top of the channel. So you have a bull breakout of a bull channel. Um, here I drew uh, another red line, so I used uh, swing lows. I used this swing low or that swing low, and I extended it up. Here's another one, drawing, drawing it across swing lows, this swing low and that swing low, and I extended it across. I wanted to see how the market behaved when it got down there. Here it broke out. Um, you can also draw um, uh, trend lines and trend channel lines as parallels. So, for example, these blue lines are parallels. This blue line is a parallel of that red line. So I drew the red line, created a parallel, and dragged it down to a swing low that would contain the price action. Same thing here. Um, we got a red line, uh, created a parallel, and dragged it down. doesn't matter how you draw them. Sometimes they're parallel, like this red line and this blue line. Sometimes they're converging, like this red line and that red line, or this one and this one, or this one and this one. Sometimes uh, they're expanding. They're all versions of channels. Sometimes they're horizontal. A trading range is just a sideways channel. Okay. As time goes on, you start to break below um, trend lines. So if I have a channel here, market broke below it and rallied again. I can draw another trend line, uh, and, and this creates a, another channel, but the channel is a little bit flatter. The slope is, slope is a little bit flatter, and the height of the channel is wider. Once the market broke below it, I then had a new swing low, and I could draw another channel. But what do you notice about this channel? 
uh, the width of it, the top to the bottom, it's broader than the earlier channels, and the slope is getting lower, right? The channels are getting flatter. With each successive breakout, channels get broader and flatter. In other words, weaker, they start to transition into trading ranges. At some point, uh, you can start to draw channels in the opposite direction. And eventually, those in the opposite direction control the market. So uh, once we broke below those uh, channels, we started to see uh, bear channels. And when the market starts to go up again, you start to draw bull channels again. And I just do that all day long on every time frame. This is the S&P uh, cash index. Okay, you know, I said that a, tr a trend um, uh, begins with a spike. In other words, a breakout. Uh, and then the momentum slows and you start to get overlap between the bars and you start to get pullbacks. That's the channel phase. So a spike is a strong trend, a channel is a weak a trend. As time goes on, the channel broadens and flattens and becomes a trading range. Okay, a channel is a weak trend and it's contained between a couple of lines. You can call the line above and the line below trend line if you want. You know, I, I usually uh, use the word trend channel line and trend line. So if I have a bull channel, channel going up to the right, the line below is the trend line. Everyone agrees with that. And the line on the top of the channel, I usually call the trend channel line. And a bear trend, uh, the market's going down to the right. Uh, the line above the bars is the trend line, and then the line below is the trend channel line. Again, if you want to call both trend lines, that's okay. Some people do. Okay, why am I even talking about channels? Uh, most, firstly, first, because the market's in channels so much of the time. And you're a trader. You're trying to make a living trading, so you want to be trading. You're always looking for opportunities to trade. And channels offer uh, some pretty good trading opportunities. Uh, for example, when the market tests the top or bottom of a channel and reverses, you can have a situation where the market can go to the opposite side of the channel and your risk is uh, not very big. So you're risking to the height. Let's say you buy uh, the market pokes below the bottom of the channel and reverses up. Uh, you can buy above the reversal bar and your stop is below. Uh, so your risk is uh, not very big, but the reward uh, could be many times larger, uh, all the way up to the uh, top of the channel. Okay, uh, remember, a channel is a weak trend. It's a hybrid between uh, a spike, a strong trend, and a trading range. It's a, a transition between uh, a strong trend and a trading range. Okay, channels uh, themselves can be very strong. In other words, uh, they can be very tight, the pullbacks are very small, uh, the bars have very little overlap. And when a channel is very tight and very steep, it behaves more like a spike. And I trade it more like a spike, like a very strong trend. Other times, channels can be uh, weak. They can be very broad. Uh, they can have 10 bars up, 10 bars down, 10 bars up, 10 bars down, uh, but continuing to form higher highs and higher lows. And if you uh, look at uh, the, tr the trend, uh, it's still within a uh, channel. Uh, when you have a, a weak channel with big swings, uh, it's behaving um, much more two-sided and you can trade it much more like a trading range. In other words, you can buy and sell. You can uh, take trades in um, both directions. Okay, a strong channel, it tends to be very steep, tends to be very tight. Uh, very small pullbacks, um, very little overlap between the bars. If we're talking about a bull uh, channel, most of the bars will be bull bars. Uh, most of the bars will not have big tails on the tops of the bars. And um, if you look at the channel on a higher time frame chart, uh, in fact, it's a spike. So if you have a very tight channel on the five-minute chart, and after an hour or two, you look at the 15-minute chart, what you'll see is four or five or six consecutive uh, strong bull trend bars. Basically, you know, it'll be a spike. So a very strong channel on one time frame is a spike on a higher time frame. Um, and because it's a spike, a breakout on a higher time frame, and uh, it's usually better only to trade in the direction of the trend. A weak channel, 
uh, tends to have lots of swings, and the swings tend to be broad, like a wedge or like a stairs pattern. And uh, there's a lot of two-sided trading taking place. The bulls own the market for a few bars. The bears own the market for a few bars. If the swings up and down are uh, broad enough, uh, you can take trades in both directions, just like you can within a trading range. Okay, so here's an uh, example of the 60-minute e-minute e-mini chart. The blue boxes, spike phase, uh, lots of consecutive bull bars, very little overlap. Uh, tails are very small. Uh, here's another spike phase. Um, there's some pullbacks in here, but it's still very, very tight. If you want to call that a tight channel, you can. Uh, but this is a good example of a spike. Here's a channel. Market's going up and down and up and down, up and down, and it's contained within a couple of lines. This channel and this channel are uh, contracting, converging, right? They're wedges. Uh, and wedges are uh, examples of uh, channels. This channel, the lines are parallel. Um, it doesn't matter. They're both channels. You've got a spike and a channel. Here you have a spike down and then a channel. Here you have a spike up and a channel. And remember, a channel uh, is a hybrid between a spike, a breakout, and a uh, trading range. And it's uh, a transition into a trading range. So usually when you have a spike, like this, and then it starts to channel up, you have to be thinking that the entire picture is going to evolve into a trading range. So if you have a bull channel, uh, it's basically a bear flag because you have to assume the market's going to evolve into a trading range and test down to the bottom of the channel. So um, here we got a bull channel. So to me, I think of that as a bear flag and a pretty good chance the market's going to try to test down to the start of the channel, the bottom of the developing trading range. Here we got a spike down, a gap, and then a spike, and then a channel. A channel, bear channel, bull flag, should try to test up to the top of the tra developing trading range. Another uh, spike up here, a channel. This channel should evolve into a, a trading range, and the market will probably test down to uh, bar 17. And that's the process that takes place all day long. Within uh, these uh, channels, there are smaller spikes and smaller channels. All right, so the process takes place on all kinds of time frames. There's a spike and a smaller channel, another spike and another channel. So the process takes place on um, all time frames all day long. So the market has strong momentum, a spike. Uh, it loses momentum, becomes a channel, loses more momentum, and enters a trading range, and then it breaks out uh, in either direction. Uh, when you're entering trades, when I enter trades, um, I sometimes enter with stops. I sometimes enter with limit orders. <coughs> and um, you know why? Why the two choices? Uh, buying on a stop. Um, so let's say I'm buying on a stop above the high of the prior bar. Um, I'm buying a breakout. I'm buying the breakout of the high of the prior bar. That prior bar is probably a little bull flag on a smaller time frame chart. So if I'm buying above the high on a five-minute bar, if I looked at a one-minute chart, it's probably a one-minute bull flag. Anyway, so if you're buying on a stop above the high of the prior bar, you're buying a breakout. Every time you see a big tail on the top of a bar, what you see is a failed breakout. The market tried to become a breakout bar, it tried to become a big bull trend bar. Instead, it got a big tail on the top. So there was a failure. The market is more two-sided. If um, most of the bars have a lot of tails and they overlap the prior bar too much, most breakouts will fail. And why is that? If most of the bars have tails on the top, you have failed breakouts above. If there's a lot of overlap with the prior bars, uh, overlap trading range, most breakouts will fail. And why? why? because most uh, breakouts do fail. Most uh, trading range breakouts fail. If the market's in a trading range and it breaks out above, chances are it's going to fail and test down to the bottom. So the more bars you see on the chart that have um, lots of prominent tails, uh, the worse it is to be entering on stops and the better it is to be betting that breakouts will fail. So instead of buying on a stop above the high of the prior bar, uh, you have a better chance to make money if you short uh, on a limit order at the high of the prior bar. So um, 
when you have lots of overlapping bars, lots of tails, uh, small bodies on the bars, uh, you have trading range behavior. Trading range is better to buy low and sell high, and not buy high hoping for higher, not sell low uh, hoping for lower. Okay, here's an example of a day that was a, a good uh, a day for swings early on, and then it evolved into a, a limit order type of day. Okay, when you look at these two chart, uh, two sides of the chart, left hand side, you can see buying on a stop here, you can expect good follow through. Selling on a stop here, good follow through. Buying on a stop here, at least you can get a scalp. Uh, two legs up, selling here. Okay, but once you start seeing this uh, sideways bars, the bars mostly overlap the prior bar. The tails start to become prominent. The bars start to become uh, uh, the bodies start to become small. Uh, you start to get um, alternating bear bar, bull bar, bear bar, bull bar, right? When you see that kind of a market, uh, entering on stops um, becomes um, less likely to be uh, successful. And uh, if you're trading and you're experienced, you enter on limit orders. So, for example, once you start seeing this, you know, you place a buy limit order to buy the low of that bar. You don't sell below looking for a move down. You buy below looking for a failed breakout and a reversal up. <clears throat> Same with over here. You buy below here. Maybe you sell up here, right? Uh, this is a limit order type of market. When you see this, you, know, you buy below there. You don't sell below it. Um, traders starting out, when the market looks like it does over here on the, on the right, uh, you're better off not trading it. When you're starting out, you should only be trading the market when it looks like this. Uh, not much overlap. Consecutive bars, the bodies are pretty big relative to the tails. You know, consecutive trend bars. You know, you got three bull bars here. You got, you know, four bear bars here. Um, that's the kind of market you should look for. And once you start to see this, you, even after four or five bars of it, um, if you're starting out, don't trade. You know, just wait for it to look like this again. Even if that means you have to wait all day, uh, it's better to not trade because uh, your goal is to make money. And if you're trading in a market where your style of trading is going to cause you to lose money, uh, you're doing the exact opposite of what you should be doing. So uh, this is not a stop uh, order market over here on the right in the red. And uh, if you're starting out and you see the market starting to look like that, don't trade. Uh, you can try trading limit orders, but um, you know, to me, I think if you're starting out, it's just too, uh, it's too hard to do. A lot of times when I trade limit orders, um, I scale in. And if you're starting out, you, it's just too scary to scale into trades. You know, so if you sell the high of this bar uh, and you sell more a point or two higher and more a point or two higher, expecting the market to come back here, well, you know what? You're probably right. But if you're starting out, uh, you're going to get so upset when you see um, this next bar being a bull bar uh, that you know, you'll exit and take the loss, and you'll be doing that all day long. So it's much better to uh, not trade than to uh, try to do something that is beyond your comfort zone. You know, you have to be comfortable when you're trading, and you have to be happy. And um, you know, if you're going to be doing this long term, year after year after year, I've been doing this now for 25 years. Uh, you have to be happy. You have to be able to come to work in the morning and feel like, boy, I just can't wait to um, to get started. You can't be thinking, oh my gosh, you know, yesterday I lost seven points on taking a bunch of trades that I really shouldn't have taken, and I'm afraid to take trades today. I can't afford to lose anymore. Hey, I to take a bunch of uh, bad trades in the first hour, thinking that thinking that most traders. Um, Sorry, uh, is now a good time to ask a few. Yeah, is now a good time to ask a few questions uh, that are relative to the slides that you've shown, or, or do you have breaks in their PowerPoint for questions? Uh, in, in general, I prefer questions at the end, but if you have some that you, uh, if you have a couple that are uh, that you think are, uh, you know, really helpful, I would do it because a lot of times I, I don't want to lose my train of thought. I, I can try. Okay. Well, well, I'll try to keep them extremely relevant. Uh, one person is asking, is the red section on the uh, chart right now, is that what, what you would consider barbed wire? Yes. Okay. That's a barbed wire look. Lots of overlapping bars. Um, the bars largely overlap the prior bars. Um, the tails are very prominent. The bodies are small. 
um, you have alternating bull bodies and uh, bear bodies. So that's a barbed wire type of market. I've been trying to get away from that terminology and instead just talk about um, tight trading ranges simply because um, uh, referring to a trading range as being tight is um, more wide, it's a more widely used phrase. But to me, uh, I sometimes do say barbed wire and uh, you know, this is clearly a barbed wire type of market. Some people call it a crankshaft market. But in any case, it's a very dangerous market for a person starting out. And as soon as you see it, you know, three, four, or five bars in, um, you know, just stop trading. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to ask everybody to to please hold okay, questions why? until the end of your of your presentation, and then we'll do a Q and A at the very end. Okay. All right. Why are uh, channels difficult? Uh, well, first of all, all trading is difficult, but with channels, a lot of times uh, the uncertainty is high because it's two-sided, especially a broad channel. You know, the market's going up and going down, up and going up and down. Uncertainty is high, so that means uh, probability is often 50-50. It can be less than 50-50. Also, uh, the reward can be relatively low compared to the risk, especially when the channel starts to become weak. Um, you know, your profit target, you know, the market's transitioning into a trading range, and if you're buying at the top of the channel, you're buying possibly near the top of a trading range. So there may not be much left um, uh, for profit. And once the market starts to enter into a channel, um, you're starting to get pullbacks. Instead of traders buying above the uh, last swing high, they're starting to sell. They're taking profits or they're even shorting. So channels are always trying to reverse, and that, uh, that creates uncertainty. And then the biggest fear that everyone has is this last point. Sometimes you'll have a bull channel uh, that breaks above, breaks out of the top of the channel, and keeps and just keeps running and accelerating. You know, if you, I don't have the weekly chart of the stock market um, uh, in October, November, 1994, when the Republicans took over Congress, but that's a perfect example. You had a, a channel that's been going up for a number of years, double top with the 87 high, and instead of breaking out of the bottom, it was a bull channel, instead of breaking out of the bottom, it broke out of the top. It went up for a week, another week, another week, another week, uh, and it just started getting consecutive week after week after week of uh, bull trend bars. And that was the start of the bull market that we're still in. We're now in the trading range, uh, 10 year trading range uh, after that bull spike, and we're still in it. Same true, and same is true of the bear channel. You know, I said bear channels are uh, bull flags, but sometimes instead of breaking out to the upside, they break out to the downside and accelerate down. And that's the great fear that everyone has uh, of uh, you know, huge uh, risk. I have an example of that that I'll show in a few minutes. Also, why else is uh, trading channels hard? Uh, all trading is hard. Uh, it's a zero-sum game, and you're trying to take money from very smart people. Uh, you're basically, basically trying to take money from hedge funds. You're not trying to take money from the other people in this room. All the individual traders make up maybe 5% of the market. 95% of the market is uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, you know, Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan and Citibank and hedge funds all over the place. And that 95% of the market is not looking at us as the source of their income. We don't have enough money. They're trying to take money from each other. Um, so that tells you that the, the edge, the margin is uh, very slim, right? If, uh, if you get basically a group of equally smart people trying to take money from each other, um, it's very hard to do. <clears throat> um, so you know, whenever you're taking a trade, as confident as you are that your trade is great, in fact, it's not all that great, and your edge is not all that big. So um, you can't get overly confident. And, um, you know, you have to realize that, uh, you know, the other side is probably always going to be at least 40% uh, likely to be right. And you're, even at your best, you have to assume that you're not going to be right more than 60% of the time. Can you be right more than that? Yes. I have lots of days in which I don't have any losing trades. But that, you know, took a long, long time to get here. Also, you know, I, m most of that is scalping. You know, scalping is high probability. But for the most part, I assume that I'm not, never more than 60% right when I'm looking at a setup. And, um, and so that means my edge is small. 
at the end of the day, I tend to get tired. Um, so what does that mean? It means I'm not as good. I don't read the charts as well. Uh, I'm not as confident. Uh, I might make more mistakes when I place my orders. You know, I trade multiple accounts, and it's easy to make mistakes. Uh, yet my competition is on uh, uh, the group of institutions, and 75% uh, of their trading is done by computers. Uh, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock Pacific time, those computers are not tired. They're trading as well as they did at 6.30 when the market opened. Right? I'm not, so I tend to get cautious at the end of the day. Um, when there's a report, um, let's say it's 7, uh, 7 o'clock, 10 o'clock Eastern time, the market can move very quickly. Uh, those computers can make two or three trades before the price on my chart even changes one tick. You know, there's latency. Uh, you know, they're, they're they're right next to the exchange, and uh, you know, just think about how uh, many steps there are uh, from the time a trade uh, takes place and it uh, registers as a uh, a movement on my chart on my computer. You know, you can say, well, Al, that might only be a second or half a second. That's right but um, the computers are trading um, based on milliseconds, you know, thousands of a second. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting data that's somewhat delayed, even though it's real-time data. And, and those computers have algorithms. They're receiving uh, data from reports uh, in numerical form from uh, Dow Jones News Service. So um, they're, they're, they're trading as automated based on those numbers. Um, and they're making decisions far faster than I can make my decisions. They're placing their orders far faster than I can place my orders. Um, they can trade reversals far faster than I can think. Um, so they have an edge over me uh, at the time um, of a report or any time the market is moving quickly. So um, I rarely take uh, a trade uh, at 7 o'clock or, or like when the FOMC comes out, I usually wait a bar or two before I enter because speed is important. I don't have speed, and my opponents, the computers, do. So anytime um, I have less of an edge, or anytime my opponent has an edge, um, I don't trade. Okay, I was talking about how trading range breakouts fail. The market has inertia. When I'm trading, I always want to bet that the market will continue to do what it's been doing. When the market's, uh, when it's trending, it's always forming pullbacks. Every one of those pullbacks is an attempt uh, to reverse the trend, right? But 80% of those attempts will fail and become uh, flags. So if the market's selling off hard and you get a pullback bar, you can look at it and say, wow, this is a reversal. It's a climactic, climactic reversal. Um, it's not. It's going to be a bear flag 80% of the time. This is approximately. But you know, basically, most of the time, if the market's in a trend and it's trying to reverse, uh, it's going to be uh, a flag. If it's in a bear trend, the reversal will become a, a bear flag. If it's in a bull trend, the reversal will evolve into a bull flag. When it's in a trading range, it's always trying to break out into a trend, but 80% of the attempts to break out will fail. So you'll see very strong rallies and you'll be absolutely convinced that the rally is the start of a bull trend. And then you see the market reverse and collapse and uh, have a very strong sell-off, and you become convinced the market's now in a bear trend. And you're wrong both times. The bull trend that you see is a bull leg within a trading range. The bear trend that you see is a bear leg within a trading range. And uh, most attempts to reverse will fail. The market constantly gets sucked down to the bottom of the range and sucked up, vacuumed up to the top of the range, only to reverse. So betting on a trading range breakout is a losing prop proposition. Most trading range breakouts uh, fail. Okay. Um, I said earlier that you can have a bull channel, and the market can break out of the top of the channel. It often breaks out of the top of the channel. But most of the time, when it does, uh, it uh, reverses and then tests the bottom of the channel. Uh, look at this blue line here. This is the one that I showed earlier. Okay, the market um, testing the top of the channel, testing the top of the channel. But look over here, this bar, right? It broke out of the top of the channel. <coughs> is that likely the start of a, an accelerated uh, bull spike and an, uh, another leg up? Or is it more likely going to fail? It's probably going to fail. All right. 
Um, and then it tried again to break out of the top. It failed again. You got a third push up, uh, and, it, and it failed. You know, Goldman Sachs back here uh, was saying, uh, this is the start of a, a you, this is the daily chart of the cash index of the uh, S&P. This is late March. Uh, Goldman Sachs was saying up here that you know you, you got to buy. You know, the market's super strong. You got to buy. And I'm looking at it and I'm saying, on the weekly chart, uh, we had 11 consecutive weeks up. Uh, that's never happened in the history of the E-mini. Um, so what's the chance of that continuing? What's the chance that Goldman Sachs is right? Uh, they're, they're saying that the market is going to do something that it's never done before. Well, for me, um, I'm, I think it's likely that the market will not do something it's never done before. And in fact, the Goldman Sachs is wrong and that the market will start to trade down. So first target, when the market tries to break out of the top of a channel, the first target is the bottom of the channel. Uh, but, but, you know, as, you know, I said there are lots of channel lines to draw. Which, you know, which channel am I talking about? Uh, always the, the, most, uh, the closest one to the market. Here the market reversed after trying to break out of the top, and that, it, it fell below that line. Uh, it, it reversed up here. This line was not here at the time. But once the market started to reverse up, I then drew this line. I, knew that I, I now have another swing low, and it created another channel. When the market's reversing down, I, I, it's probably going to poke below this line. It went below it and tried to reverse up. Uh, here it reversed up strongly. I can draw another line. Okay. Um, it turns out that the current sell-off um, came all the way down to um, a trend, a parallel down here. Right. So once the market started to turn down here, I could draw a trend uh, channel line across the highs, this red line. And then I could create a parallel and drag it to uh, prior higher lows. For example, this one, market went through it. Drag it down to this one, and this is what the market is currently uh, doing. This, this chart's actually um, um, a few weeks old or a couple weeks old, and the market is um, now up here. Um, but anyway, it, it reversed down. This, there are no other channels that I can draw in the daily chart. This is uh, the, the broadest channel that I can draw. So when the market started to reverse down, it went all the way down to the final possibility before it started to go up again. Uh, Apple, monthly chart. Uh, remember I said sometimes the market can be in a bull channel. I always think of it as a bear flag. But instead of breaking out to the downside, as you would expect from a bear flag, you can get a strong breakout to the upside. And that's what took place here. Right? And this is everyone's fear when they're shorting uh, bull channels. That every now and then, this is what happens. You get a strong breakout above the top of the bull channel, and you get a new spike base. Now, something about this channel uh, is interesting. Look at the red trend line below. If I create a parallel and drag it uh, to the swing highs, I can create this. I get this blue line, and I create a channel. It broke strongly above that. Well, suppose I create another uh, parallel of this red line and keep dragging it up to a prior swing high over here. Okay, look where the rally stopped. Right, it stopped right at the top of the channel, just like that um, daily chart of the E mini I showed a few minutes ago. It went to the bottom of the absolute broadest channel. Here, Apple turned down. Uh, at the top of the absolute uh, broadest uh, channel. And that's because uh, traders do this. They draw these uh, uh, trend channel lines. They draw these parallels. And uh, the bulls, in this case, are looking for places to take profits. Uh, one obvious place is at the top of a channel. Aggressive bears uh, look at the top of the channel uh, to uh, go short, uh, mostly for scalps. Whenever I take a counter trend trade, you know, a trade that's not a major trend reversal. Um, I'm only looking for a scalp. Okay, go, going back to a strong bull trend, like the spike phase of a bull trend, not the channel phase, the spike phase where you start having a bull trend bar, another bull trend bar, another bull trend bar, not much overlap, you know, no tails, okay? During the spike phase of a bull trend, the breakout phase, the strongest type of trend that there is, 
Um, how do you get one? Now, what do you do? Well, you can simply buy at the market and put a stop below the bottom of the spike. Well, you can say, well, that's, you know, on the email, let's say that's eight points away. I don't want to risk eight points. Well, guess what? If you want to make money, that's what you do. Uh, if the risk is four or five times bigger than what you normally risk, you trade four or five times smaller. So if you normally trade um, 500 shares of, uh, uh, of the spider, uh, you trade 100 and you use the correct stop. How else can I get long besides buying at the market? Um, well, you can buy the close of any strong bull bar. So if the market's going up and the bar closes near its high, just buy the close of that bar. Let's say the next buy is a bear trend bar closing near its low. Well, it's an attempt to reverse a strong trend. Uh, what's probably going to happen? Uh, it's going to evolve into a bull flag. Uh, certainly the odds are very high that the attempt to reverse will fail. So if the attempt to reverse is going to fail, uh, why not simply buy the close of that strong bear trend bar? That's a good way to enter um, in a strong bull trend. Uh, let's say you get a pullback for a bar or two. Um, you can also buy on a stop above the high of the prior bar. Let's say the market's gone up six bars in a row without a pullback. Well, guess what? Place a limit order to buy at the low of the prior bar. There will be so many traders eager to buy that if you place a limit order uh, at the low of the prior bar, uh, the market probably won't fall very far, and you'll be getting long into that bull trend. Let's say it pulls back a little bit, and it's a very strong bull trend. You can also press your bets and place a buy stop above uh, the most recent swing high and buy the breakout to a new high. Uh, you can also buy any small uh, pullback. Okay, uh, So in a strong bull breakout, you buy for any reason. Okay, When you're in a tight bull channel, not a breakout. The market's now in a channel, starting to get some overlap, some pullbacks. Remember, a tight bull channel, a very strong channel. Uh, it's a spike on a higher time frame, so I only want to look to buy. Uh, and if it's in a strong spike or in a strong span channel, uh, I usually try to swing at least uh, part of my trade. <coughs> so a strong uh, trend or uh, a strong channel. Um, I only want to buy if it's a bull trend, and I uh, prefer to swing at least part of the trade. Okay, um, so how do I buy? Pretty much the same as I do in uh, the breakout phase, the spike phase of a trend. I buy at and below the low of the prior bar. I buy a strong bull close. If there's a bear close, I buy the bear close. Uh, if, if the market pulls back for a bar or two or three or four or five, uh, I buy above the high of the prior bar. If it pulls back to the moving average, I buy with a limit order at the moving average or a small reversal up from the moving average. Um, if the market gets up to a new high above a prior high, um, in a channel, I usually start to uh, take profits uh, at new highs. Okay? Okay, so let's say you see this. Um, you're trading and you see this. You know, what are you thinking at this point? You can see there's a big gap up. You can see yesterday's high over there on the left at 11 o'clock. Yesterday's high, big gap up, well above the moving average. And let's say you don't buy this high two, two legs down. Let's say you don't buy these closes, right? Let's say you don't buy this high two, uh, second entry long. And the, market, and the market's right here uh, when you decide, gosh, I'm missing this. It's going up. You know, um, you know what am I going to do? You know, I miss, uh, you know, I've missed 10 points of uh, the move already. Um, you, know, what am, you know, what am I going to do? So at this point, you've made a diagnosis, right? You see you have a strong bull spike, a three-bar bull spike, bars 8, 9, and 10. Um, you got a bull spike sideways, and now we have some smaller bars, um, some tails on top, probably in the channel phase, but not much overlap between the bars, so this is probably a strong... Uh, channel, okay. So you want to get long, right? How do you get long, and where are your stops? Um, I'm going to talk about that over the next few slides, okay? Um, okay. You know you want to get long. You know it's a bull trend. You know if if your job is to be doing what the institutions are doing. Uh, the market's going up. 
it's clearly going up. It's probably going to go up more. The market has inertia. It usually continues to do what it's been doing. It's been going up for five or ten bars. So you have to get long. That's what the institutions are doing. They're buying. So you got to buy, but how do you do it? And if you do buy, you know, where do you put your stop? Okay? Don't um, get upset by this slide. This, I, I'm going to break this slide down into a series of uh, slides um, and talk about the different things. Uh, this is where that other slide was, right here at bar 17. Okay? You knew that you had to get long. By the way, a number of these bars, the first bar of the day is bar 1, the second bar is bar 2, and there are 81 bars in the day. And these numbers just represent the different bars of the day. So this is the 10th bar of the day. You know, this is the 62nd bar of the day. <laughs> it's just an easy way for me to reference uh, bars. Okay, so um, you have this bull spike, 8, 9, 10, pause, and then probably start of a very steep channel through here. Steep channel, it's a spike on a higher time frame chart. You only want to get long, um, and uh, you've got to figure out how to get long. And how do you do it? Uh, the red areas, I'll talk about the red areas, that's buying with stops above the high of the prior bar. The blue boxes, uh, you place limit orders at the low of the prior bar uh, to buy. And you can also uh, buy at the market. Every time you see a strong bull bar, the pink boxes, you buy the close. Anytime you see a strong bear bar, uh, you buy the close, uh, betting that the reversal attempt will fail. Okay, so the next few slides are uh, the different colors uh, that you see on this slide. Okay, so you know your strong spike, excuse me, the strong channel is the spike on a higher time frame chart. All this move up from seven to uh, thirty-eight. It's a uh, little channel type behavior on the five-minute chart. On a 15-minute chart or a 60-minute chart, it's just a series of bull trend bars. Um, so you, you, you want to start getting long? Well, you place a stop above the high of the prior bar. Okay, this bar forms, uh, and you want to get long? You can place a stop one tick above its high, and you get long there. Uh, what about this little pause here? Place a stop, a buy stop, one tick above its high, and get long there. Uh, you've got a, a, a triangle here, three pushes down. Uh, 21, uh, 24, and 27. Uh, you want to get long? You got a good-looking bull bar. It's always good to buy above bull bars, especially in a bull trend, right? So you place a buy stop one tick above its high, and you get filled here. Um, a bear reversal bar? Well, guess what? There'll be bears um, who made the mistake of shorting, and they will get out one tick above, uh, and they won't want to short again for at least a bar or two. What do you do? You can place a buy stop one tick above its high. Over here, we're starting to go sideways, so I'm less aggressive <coughs> about buying here. This is we're transitioning into a trading range, uh, so I'm not really talking about what took place between bar 40 and the end of the day. Uh, remember, channels evolve into trading ranges, and that's what took place after bar 40. Today, I'm talking about what's taking place between bar 16 and bar uh, 38 or so. What what are other ways to get long? Okay. Uh, you're looking at the market going up. Bar over here. Remember, bar 17 is when you uh, started the process. You're thinking, "My gosh, you know, I'm missing it. I got to get long." Well, I said you could buy on stops above bars. You can also buy with limit orders below bars. Um, you see the market trying to reverse. Place a buy limit order one tick or at the low of the prior bar. Same here. Place a limit order at the low of the prior bar. Up through here, I'd be less interested in um, the limit order entries. Um, I'd be extra careful. I certainly would not want to buy at limit orders at the top of a developing trading range. Buying at limit orders near the bottom, that's okay. How else can you get long? You can enter on stops. You can enter with limit orders. And you can simply buy uh, at the market, at the close of any strong bull bar. So you see bar uh, 18 close, you simply buy at the close of the bar. Bar 19, it's a strong bull bar, you buy. Uh, bar 27 uh, right here, strong bear bar, you buy its, uh, you buy its close. Uh, you buy that close, all right? doesn't matter, bull bar or bear bar. Bull bar, market's probably, probably going to continue higher. Uh, bear bar, uh, it's an attempt to reverse. Most reversal attempts will fail. And if the trend is strong, as it is uh, here, um, Chances are the reversal won't go very far at all, so it gives a good opportunity to buy. 
Okay, so once you took your um, entry, so now that you're long, what do you do? You know, you're in the market. Um, you have to start thinking about, I have to place a protective stop. And uh, what do you do for your stop? Well, it depends on what your goal is. If you're swinging your long, um, you have to use a swing stop. And the best way to do that is to put a stop below the most recent higher low. A bull trend is making higher highs and higher lows. Anytime you enter and you're looking for a swing, you look back to the prior higher low, and that's where your stop is. You say, well, Al, that's six points below. I don't want to risk six points. I only like to risk two points or less. Well, guess what? If you want to trade this for a swing, if you're looking for a swing up, that's what you have to risk. You have to risk to below the low, uh, that uh, most recent higher low. And you say, well, Al, that's six points. Well, that's right. You're risking six points, but you're swinging. Uh, usually, uh, you should go for a profit target equal to your risk. If you see that you have to risk six points, guess what? You probably will end up making six points. So just use a profit target up there around six points higher. Let's say you're buying after the market's already gone up three or four or five bars, uh, and you just want to scalp. You think, well, maybe it'll go up six bars, maybe a seventh bar, uh, and you know it'll pull back soon. So you don't want to swing at this point. You just want to scalp. Um, when you're scalping, you don't want to allow pullbacks. So if you're buying, <clears throat> looking for a scalp, a one or a two bar move up, you know, one point move, two point move up, you've got to get out below um, any um, bear bar. So if you enter and the next bar is a bear bar, you get out below its low. Um, if the next bar is a strong bull bar, you don't want the market to trade below the low of that bar. You get out below that low. So when you're scalping, um, you have to use very tight stops because your profit target is very small. And in general, you don't want your risk to be greater than your reward. So if you're scalping, that means you're going for a small reward. You have to uh, have a small risk. And you only take a scalp if you're really uh, confident that the trade is good. So scalp, you need a high probability because you're going for a reward that's equal to about your risk, and you can only make money um, going for uh, a small profit if you have a high probability. Okay, here's that same chart. Remember back here, bar 17, we're talking about getting long, right? Uh, uh, so where would you put your stop? I gave several several examples of entries here. So let's say you bought. Um, this close on this uh, uh, bar 16, or let's say you bought the close on bar, uh, let's say bar 19, let's say you bought that close, uh, where's your stop? It depends on your goal. If you're looking for a swing, you should go back to the most recent higher low, which is the bar 15 low, and your initial protective stop for any long all through here, if you're looking for a swing, is below that low. Um, if the market uh, has a pullback and then goes to a new high, you raise your stop up to below the most recent um, higher low. So if you bought this close, uh, we had this uh, trading range or triangle, and the market broke out to a new high. Once it gets above that high, uh, you trail your stop up below the most recent higher low. Over here, we had an outside up bar. Uh, it's strong enough, especially once you've had a, a second bar up, you could probably trail your stop here. <coughs> Um, if you're concerned that you don't want to risk uh, this many points uh, and you bought the bar 19 close, where else could you put a stop? You could put it one tick below the low of the most recent strong bull bar, which would be this bar. Um, there's the risk that this is a, a by climax and a one bar final flag, but um, you know, I, don't want to, <coughs> I don't want to go off uh, topic right here. But I do want to make the point that if you don't want to risk all the way to below 15, especially if you bought on uh, bar 19 and you're looking for a smaller stop, you could use a, point, a, a money management stop like two points or 10 ticks or something. Or you could put your stop below the most recent strong uh, bull trend bar, like below that bar. Let's say you bought bar 16 and you only wanted to scalp, right? Um, 
or if you bought the close of bar 16, or if you bought on bar 17 as it went above bar 16, uh, you don't want pullback. So your initial stop is below your signal bar, uh, the 16 uh, low. And um, you, you're going for a goal that is at least as many ticks as your stop. Once, you're, uh, once it hits your goal, you get out. The bigger the risk, right, the greater the risk, uh, the higher the probability of success. So if you bought the 19 close and you used a stop below 15, a very big stop, uh, you have a much better chance of making at least some profit than you do if you instead put your stop um, you know, uh, one tick below the low of the bar. This is true all the time. The wider the stop, the higher the probability of profit. But um, that greater profit is being paid for by the greater risk. That when you do lose, you lose far more uh, ticks than you do with a smaller stop. <clears throat> Usually, um, you know, the market always you're always taking trade-offs between risk, reward, and probability. And it doesn't matter which of the three you favor. Um, you know, if you favor one, you have to pay for it with one of the others. So if you want a bigger reward, you probably have to pay for it uh, uh, with probability. <coughs> so there's a smaller chance of making a bigger reward. If you are a person who only wants high probability trades, well, guess what? High probability trades usually don't go very far. So you're trading off. Um, you're taking higher probability. You pay for it with a smaller uh, reward. Right? You'll make less money. Anytime you take a high probability trade, you're going to make uh, fewer ticks. Okay, going back to a weak bull channel. Bull tells you it's a trend. Channel implies a weak trend. The weaker, you know, I've been talking for the past 10 minutes about a, a strong channel. Now I'm going to be talking about weak channels. The weaker the channel it, it, it is, you know, the broader the swings, the flatter the slope, the more trading is taking place in both directions, um, and the more it will behave like a trading range. I've been talking about bull trends and bull channels and bull spikes all day long. Um, the same holds true for um, bear trends bear breakouts, bear uh, uh, channels. Okay, what's a weak bull channel in contrast to uh, a strong bull channel? A weak bull channel, uh, you have a lot of overlapping bars. Uh, you have usually have weak uh, follow-throughs. So you see a bull trend bar. Next bar, instead of being a bull trend bar, might be a small doji or might even be a bear bar. Uh, a lot of bars have tails on the tops of the bars. So instead of strong breakout bars, uh, you're getting selling going into the close of the bar. Also, you'll notice that there are many bars that have bare bodies. So you might have a bull body or two, and then a smaller bear body or two. Also, the market might go up for a bar or two or three, and then trade below the low of the prior bar. Uh, so you have pullbacks. Sometimes the pullbacks last two, three, four, five bars and become small. Uh, bear swings. Okay, so um, overlapping bars, you have overlapping bars, right? Um, and you have weak follow through, so you've got a bull bar and then a bear bar. You know, you've got a bull bar and then a small bar and then a doji bar, right? Many bars with tails on the top. Tail here, tails here, lots of tails through here, tails on tops of the bars. Many bars with bear bodies. You've got a bull bar, bear bar, bull bar, bear bar. A whole bunch of bear bars here, a bunch of bear bars here. Um, you have uh, obvious uh, pullbacks, some of them lasting many bars. Here we pulled back for uh, 15 bars. Here we pulled back for um, another 15 bars. All right? uh, sometimes you'll get tradable swings uh, in the opposite direction. You know, sometimes you'll get a setup where you might be able to scalp a short, like here. But it's still a bull uh, trend. right? Um, it's walking up the moving average, right? It's finding support at the moving average. It's forming higher lows and higher highs, right? And I don't have trend channel lines drawn in here, but uh, a trend, uh, like you could see that this is a channel, probably a little bit of a wedge shape, you know, but it's still a channel. Ignore the text that I have here. I'll talk about that later. I have this is a duplicate slide. I'll talk about it later. Uh, I put a, I put a copy of it here just to illustrate. Uh, the points that make traders see it as a weaker bull channel. 
Okay, so you often have tradable swings in both uh, directions. Uh, it basically behaves like a trading range that is tilted up. There's two-sided trading. The more it looks like a trading range, the more I trade it like a trading range. Trading range, I buy low, I sell high, and I scalp. Okay, I, if it's a bull trend, a bull channel, uh, or broad bull channel, a weak bull ch uh, channel, I look to buy at support and I look to take profits and sometimes even go short uh, at new highs and at resistance. So I trade it like a trading range, buy low, sell high, scalp. Stops, if it's in a channel, uh, remember if it's in a weak channel with very broad swings and pretty flat slope, uh, it's, it's behaving much like a trading range. I want to trade it like a trading range. Uh, remember, trading range, buy low, sell high, scalp. Since I'm scalping, right, um, I don't want to allow pullbacks, right? So if I buy low and I'm scalping, I don't want to allow a pullback. If the market uh, starts to go up my way and forms a bear reversal bar, I'll probably get out below that bear reversal bar, even if that means I lose a tick or two or only make a tick or two. Uh, when I'm scalping, I don't want to allow uh, pullbacks. My initial stop is below my signal bar. So if the prior bar was a bull reversal bar and I buy one tick above the high, my stop is one tick below the low. Okay. So for example, over here, if I bought on bar 30 as it went above bar 29, right? I got two legs down. Um, uh, it's actually a triangle, three pushes down. Push down at 26, 28, and 30. So I'm buying the breakout of the triangle. Let's say I buy above 29. Uh, that's my signal bar. That's the bar that tells me to get long if it moves one tick above it. My initial stop is one tick below its low. If I buy um, on 47 going above 46, or if I buy 48 going above 47, my initial stop is one tick below the low. Uh, if I buy 56 going above uh, 55, uh, 55 is my signal bar. My stop is one tick below its low. <coughs> Why not buy above 54? In general, I prefer to buy above bull bars, especially bull bars that close near their high. So I think buying above 55 is a stronger buy than buying above 54. If I buy above 66, my initial stop is one tick below its low. I see a terrible entry bar, the bar in which I entered. I might exit one tick below, below that bear bar. It turns out um, the stop would not have been hit. I would have been able to uh, go ahead and make a scalp. Okay, so a weak bull channel, protective stops, um, initially below the signal bar. If you're trying to swing part or if you're trying to go for a bigger scalp, um, you can uh, trail your stop up. So let's say initially you bought above bar 29. Initial stop is the red line, one tick below its low. Let's say you're holding part of it for a bigger scalp or even letting part of it swing. Once you see a strong bull bar, like bar 33, you put your stop one tick below its low. A bear bar, put your stop one tick below its low. A big bull breakout bar, you trail your stop one tick below uh, the low of the most recent strong bull bar. <laughs> okay, let's say you uh, bought over here above bar, uh, here's bar 46. Let's say you bought above bar 46 or 47 and you, you did not scalp out um, for one point up here on this uh, bull bar, bar 49, and you st instead see this uh, bear bar, um, to me, you get out below the low. <coughs> this is, I think, an interesting market uh, and this happens uh, you know, fairly regularly. You can see the moving average. The market's way below the moving average. So uh, big, big gap down. And three pushes down. The market gapped down to one, pushed down again to six, and then down again to eight. So it's a wedge. Wedge is a channel. It's a down channel, so it's a bull flag. Right? It's a wedge bull, uh, it's a wedge bull flag. Or you call it a wedge bottom. doesn't matter. Anyway, it's a potential bottom. Uh, but take a look at what's going on in here. Look at bar two very strong bull bar closing on its high tick. So pretty good buying there. And then again, bar six, pretty good buying there. And then again, bar 11, 
pretty good buying there. So the market's building buying pressure, a lot of buying going on. Um, it's sold off below bar three. It's sold off below bar seven. Do you want to short below bar 10? Okay, this is important. Okay, take a look at bar 10. Um, just like bar seven, big tail on the bottom, another big tail on the bottom. You have three pushes down, right? So possible wedge bottom. Uh, the correct stop on a wedge below the bottom of the wedge, so below bar nine. Look at bar 11. It double bottomed with bar nine. Why did it not go below bar nine? <clears throat> because bulls knew that if it fell below bar nine, it could be a failed wedge and it could lead to a measured move down. So a lot of the bulls who bought, uh, who have been buying all through here, uh, those who bought above bar nine also, uh, they're expecting um, that uh, the market will not fall below below bar nine. So here you have a weak signal bar for the bears. Um, you, know, you gap down well below the moving average. Uh, the last two shorts worked. Um, you know, what am I going to do here? Uh, we're starting to get buying pressure, strong bull bars, the third one, uh, tails on the bottom of bars. Is this a good looking short or is it more likely that there'll be buyers at and below bar 10? To me, I think it's more likely that there are buyers here. So <laughs> anytime you have any kind of a sell climax, you always have to be thinking that um, the market will go up. And anytime you see a bad looking sell signal bar, uh, you have to assume traders shorting below it will lose money. That means that um, if, you, if you do the opposite, you're in a good position to make money. Right? So to me, this is for advanced uh, traders looking for a, a channel up. Probably you're going to get a channel up in this situation, a wedge bottom. <laughs> lots of buying pressure, probably all the sell signals will fail. So a low one short, a breakout pullback short here, second entry short here, uh, three pushes up, wedge here, double top, call it whatever you want. Right? Look at these tails on the bottom of the bars. Every tail on the bottom of a bar is a failed bear breakout. So the market is starting to get a lot of failed bear breakouts ever since bar one. They're buying at the bottoms of the bars. Right? So to me, uh, as a trader, when I start to see this, uh, I'm a trader. I want to make money. To make money, I have to trade. Uh, for me, uh, I'm expecting the sell signals to fail. So instead of shorting uh, down here, to me, th these are good opportunities to buy. <coughs> and you don't have to risk much. You know, maybe risk you know, you know, five ticks, six ticks, seven ticks. And you always try to go for a reward at least as big as your um, as your risk. Um, and the point of this slide is to uh, uh, say, illustrate that sometimes you can get bull channels forming in situations when it's easy to be thinking um, bear trend, right? But uh, you got a, a possible wedge bottom, lots of buying pressure. To me, the odds are the market's going to go up to the moving average. And if I see a signal bar like bar 10 that doesn't look very good or bar 12 that doesn't look very good, instead of shorting below, I'll buy with a limit order at the low of the bar, expecting a channel up to at least the moving average. This is not something that uh, beginners should do, but I'm, I'm just bringing it up to give uh, traders something to think about uh, you know, as time goes on. Then, uh, you know, sometimes the market reverses in the form of a channel, and uh, experienced traders are buying at the lows of the prior bar. That's why you're getting all those tails at the lows of the, uh, at the lows of every bar. You know, traders are buying at the lows of the bar. Uh, another type of uh, channel is a, a stairs pattern. You know, uh, it's just stair stepping down. Every pullback goes above the prior uh, swing low. So the market broke below uh, bar 30, and it came back up and tested the um, uh, the bar 29 low. Uh, it broke below bar 34 over here, okay, and uh, every pullback tends to be bigger. Uh, the pullback from the breakout below 29 came exactly to the breakout point. When the market breaks below 34, I think that this time it should not only come back to the breakout point, it probably will go above. Okay, the market's stair-stepping down. Every time it goes to a new low, anytime it breaks out below 
the prior swing low. It, it'll pull back at least to that low, probably to above that low. So break out below this low, I expect it to pull back above that low. Break out above, break out below this low, I expect it to pull back at least to uh, to that low. And um, this box here represents the 29 low, the breakout point, uh, to where the market turned up. Okay, so that's the size of the stair. This pink box is the size of this stair. So the market broke below the 34 low and turned up here at the 46 low, uh, which is the bottom of this pink box. And what do you see? This pink box is smaller than this pink box. So the breakouts are getting smaller. So what does that tell me? It tells me that probably if the market falls below 30, uh, 46, it probably will not fall more than it did here. So the next pink box will probably be smaller than this box. So if I place a limit order, uh, let's say you know four ticks below that low, and risk to the height of this box, uh, so this box is about nine ticks tall, okay? So if I buy four ticks down, I expect it will not fall nine ticks down, uh, so I can risk five ticks and try to make a couple points on the bounce. <clears throat> so, um, you know, this is a shrinking stairs pattern, and this is another example of uh, once you get comfortable you know, reading markets, uh, spike down here, starting to channel, you can start fading uh, breakouts. Um, how do I know that uh, traders are doing that? Because that's what, just look at the chart, that's what the chart's doing. And that tells you that that's what the institutions are doing. They're fading breakouts. Uh, they're buying either to take profits or to go long. And with each new low, uh, they're buying sooner than before. Here they bought uh, you know, three or four points below the prior low. Here they bought only two points below the prior low. So here they'll probably buy maybe only one point below the prior low. So once you see a, a, a channel that is in a stairs pattern and is starting to shrink, you know, aggressive, experienced traders uh, will use it as an opportunity to fade uh, breakouts. You can say, well, it's, it's obviously in a strong bear, uh, bear trend. It is. But you can still trade uh, the channel uh, uh, from the long side if you're, um, um, if you know, if you're comfortable with what um, the market is doing. Okay, sometimes a channel can be very, very broad. You got a bull spike, right? You got a series of bull bars without pullbacks, bars closing in their highs, sideways for a little bit. You have to assume the market will enter a channel. You got another bull spike, but you know, big tail on the top. <coughs> a lot of selling pressure earlier. Pretty good chance this will be a spike in channel. So a spike up, you're looking for a channel. And so I start looking for opportunities to draw uh, trend channel lines. And um, I'm looking to buy pullbacks initially, right? Uh, market uh, pulls back to a higher low, okay? Here you're testing, the 48 low is testing the uh, 32 high, very common in channels. Uh, I'm looking to buy above uh, the most recent uh, bull bar. So buying above 49, maybe buy above 50, a better looking bull bar expecting a channel to form. Sometimes the pullbacks are very, very deep. You can see, you can see bar 70 um, uh, did not fall below 48. We're still making higher lows, but at this point the market came down so far that the market's probably transitioned into a uh, trading range. Uh, my point about um, a broad channel, the pullbacks are very deep and um, it's uh, in the process of evolving into a trading range. Um, I'd rather trade it more like a trading range. So if I, I think the market's in a broad channel, uh, I want to trade it like a trading range. I want to buy low, uh, sell high, certainly sell high to, to sell out of my longs to take profits. And sometimes I'll even sell uh, high uh, to, uh, uh, to short. Um, since it's a bull trend, um, if I have to choose between buying and selling, I'd rather um, buy. And so to me, the selling is optional, but if you're going to trade, you have to be looking to take the buys, uh, like above 24, like maybe above 22, maybe above 32, um, maybe above 49 or 50, or 51 even, close on the high tech. 
Okay. Sometimes a broad channel can uh, uh, be contained by converging lines. In other words, you can form a wedge bottom or a wedge full flag, but it's still a channel. Uh, the swings are still big. You know, look at look how high up this uh, leg went up to bar 29. Right, so the swings are big enough uh, that as it's forming, you're thinking, is this a trading range or is this a channel? Doesn't matter. If you can't tell, assume it's a trading range and look to buy low, sell high, and scalp. At the end of the day, you'll look at it and say, yep, there's a channel. But you know, over here, uh, bar 48 or so, uh, you know, you're thinking, well, maybe it's just a trading range and maybe it's going to go up and test the top. Doesn't matter. Anytime um, I see a lot of two-sided trading and I can't tell if it's a channel, a broad channel or a trading range, I trade them the same. I trade them like a trading range. I buy low, I sell high, and I scalp. So if I bought above bar 47, um, I'm looking to scalp. You know, scalp how many points? You know, one point, two points. Uh, it doesn't matter. It depends on uh, the price action. Certainly, at least one point. But broad channel, um, it behaves much more like a trading range. I trade it like a trading range. And I will take trades in both directions. I want to talk a little bit about um, the um, current market. Uh, this is uh, the monthly chart of the uh, S&P. And you can everyone sees this is the 1994 um, bull breakout that I talked about. There was a, a bull channel, therefore a bear flag. And instead of a bear breakout, we got a bull breakout back here in 1994-1995. And this is the third push up. You can argue it's a large head and shoulders top. Uh, you can say there's a nested three push pattern within it. To me right now, we're channeling up. Um, uh, the market's holding above the moving average. Uh, it might come down to the trend line. I don't know. Uh, you can see three pushes here, uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. Sometimes the second push is so strong that uh, the count gets reset, uh, and this becomes the first push, this the second push, and we might get one more push up. Monthly chart to me, uh, pretty neutral, uh, slightly bullish, pretty good buy, uh, buying pressure. Um, I don't know if we go up from here and you know, we pull back to the monthly moving average. Uh, to me, when I look at this, I'm not looking at this as a major top. So, you know, can you argue this is a major head and shoulders top? Uh, you know, sure. But, um, you know, I'm not willing to take shorts based on that. Um, and also, you can argue that this is a three push top, call it a wedge top, doesn't matter. Uh, to me, uh, I would not be taking shorts on that basis either. Um, you know, we got very strong bull spikes up here. Uh, I think we probably go sideways to up on this uh, monthly chart of the uh, E-mini, or the uh, S&P. Here's the weekly chart. You know, we had a, a channel from 2009 through 2011. We tried to break out of the top twice, and we reversed down. And what did we do? We broke out of the bottom. Um, um, I don't have the parallel drawn in here, but this actually tested just about uh, equal to the parallel over here. Um, we're in a broader channel. Um, right now, we have a couple legs down. Will we come all the way down to the green line? Um, I don't know. This, this chart is a week or two old. Um, but uh, when I look at this, uh, when I look at the uh, weekly chart of the cash index, you can argue a sloped head and shoulders top, left shoulder, head, right shoulder. Um, the market's deciding whether um, <clears throat> It's trending down, and we'll get down here to the 1,200 area, or whether this is uh, just a two-legged correction and a bull trend, and it's going to go up to uh, 1,500. Um, when the market was, uh, you know, pretty much anywhere in here, I was talking about um, the market may trade sideways as it did here in 2011 for uh, six months, and we might end up doing that now. So we may be in the process of uh, going sideways. Uh, we had a lower trading range here, 2011, an upper trading range here, and a big space between the two. Uh, so there's a big gap in here, and right now we're filling in that gap. And it turns out it's uh, in the same price where the market was for uh, most of 2011. So I would not be surprised if we go sideways here 
for a long time on the weekly chart. Daily chart uh, of the cash index. Again, this chart is uh, uh, behind. It's, I don't know if it's a, I don't know how many days behind it is, but it's certainly behind. I'm just taking a look at it on my other computer. Okay, so it's, it looks like it's a couple of weeks. Um, no, no, not really. It's only actually this is only about a day or so uh, delayed. That looks like yesterday. Um, but anyway, you can see channels. It keeps breaking below trend lines. Um, what traders are deciding is um, was this a lower high major trend reversal? Uh, we had a bull channel, a bull trend. We broke below the trend line. We formed a two-legged uh, lower high, and um, the bears see this as a lower high major trend reversal. Uh, even though uh, the current rally is above this high, it's not above this high. So the bears still see this as a broad uh, bear trend, broad uh, bear channel. The bulls, on the other hand, see this sell-off as simply a wedge bull flag. So the bears have a good argument, and the bulls have a good argument. Whenever the bulls and bears both have a good argument, what does the market usually do? It goes sideways. And this is what I was talking about. The market was in a trading range here in 2011, uh, trading range here for several months, uh, beginning of 2012. And there's a big gap between the two trading ranges. The market usually fills in gaps. And uh, we've been going sideways here for about a month in this gray box, uh, the space between the uh, lower trading range and the upper trading range. And I don't see any reason for that to uh, change. I want to go back to this weekly chart again for a second. I mentioned in here, um, this is the, the cash index, but on the futures index, the E-mini, uh, there were 11 consecutive bull trend bars. Uh, that's never happened in the history of the E-mini. Right? When something um, never happens, uh, has never happened, uh, the E-mini has been around for 10 years or so, right? Um, when something happens and it's never happened before, it's probably climactic and unsustainable. And when that's the case, the market usually will correct for about 10 bars and two legs. And that's what we've had. We've had two, two legs down and about 10 bars. But when the market was doing this, I was telling people that this is really, really unusual. The market's never had 11 consecutive weeks up on the E-mini. So we'll probably have a bigger correction than what people think is likely. Anytime uh, the market has a, a climax, a buy climax or a sell climax, uh, the correction news usually lasts for more bars and more legs than what traders think. You know, at the time when this was forming, um, you know, everyone on TV was saying buy, 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 and I was saying, I don't know, I've never seen this before. Uh, it's probably not going to uh, last. We're probably going to enter a pretty uh, good size correction. Ten-year notes. What's going on? <clears throat> this is the monthly chart of the 10-year notes. Okay, bull spike. We had two strong months up, and a channel. All right, uh, we're, we poked out of the top of the channel, and we're reversing back down. So, guess what? I think the market will do. When the market uh, tries to break out of the top of a bull channel and reverses back down, uh, it usually tries to poke below the bottom of the channel. So, I think. Uh, that sometime in the next uh, maybe five or six months, five or six bars, <coughs> will poke below the bottom of this line. Uh, this is, I'm not saying anything profound here. You know, everyone in the world knows that uh, notes are way overdone, that we're channeling up, and that we've been very two-sided for about a year, and that we'll probably pull back. But when you look at it in terms of channels, we're trying to get a bull breakout of a bull channel. market should uh, poke below the bottom of the channel. Also a spike in channel pattern, three pushes up, first push here. Second push, 2010, third push. The third push has a nested three push pattern in it, a smaller spike and three pushes. So it looks to me like the odds are pretty good that the notes will trade down um, you know, pretty soon. Uh, daily chart of the notes, we had a bull breakout. This is that monthly uh, trend line. Uh, you can see we broke above it and reversed down. Daily chart, we had a bull breakout of a bull channel, and we poked below the bottom of the channel. That was the minimum objective. 
tight trading range now, you can call it barbed wire. 50-50 uh, chance bull breakout, 50-50 chance uh, bear breakout. <coughs> gold, everyone likes to talk about gold. Uh, you know, Peter Schiff all through here was talking about uh, gold, uh, you know, soaring, buy gold, buy gold, buy gold. And Dennis Gartman, same thing. And I'm looking at it and saying, I don't know. That's a bull breakout of a bull channel. Uh, two chances out of three, it's going to trade back into the channel and poke below the bottom of the channel. And that's what it ultimately did. Uh, big up, big down, big confusion, sideways. So uh, when the market was doing this, I told uh, everyone uh, within, uh, uh, within my room that we probably were going to go sideways, which is what we've been doing. Where do we go from here? Uh, the bulls see a double top um, and a major trend reversal. The bears see a triangle and a bull flag. To me, I see a trading range after a bull trend and uh, the breakout. Uh, it's probably 50-50 chance up, 50-50 chance down. Apple monthly chart, I mentioned this earlier. You draw this trend line, and then you create a parallel, and you drag it above swing highs, like here or here. And you can see uh, that it hit the top of the channel using uh, the swing highs from 07 probably going to go sideways. I don't know how many months it'll go sideways, but probably um, go sideways. Will we come all the way back down to the bottom of the channel? Um, uh, at some point we will, but uh, to me I think it's more likely that we go sideways at least some. Uh, maybe we'll have one more uh, attempt up and then a bigger correction. But for Apple I would not be shorting. Weekly chart Apple, um, there was a bull channel and we had a bull breakout of a bull channel. Um, uh, we had uh, another bull channel, the blue lines, and uh, we poked out of the top, reversed down, and came below the bottom of it, right? So you have a bull breakout of a bull channel, you always look for a pull back to the bottom. On the, um, on the uh, weekly chart, I can draw a trend line or trend channel line across the tops. This green line, create a parallel and drag it down here, right? So um, to look for a target on the downside, uh, to me it looks like you know, we're, we're, we might be creating this green channel. We don't know yet, but if we do, uh, the target is the bottom of the channel, which is this green line, and right now it's around 500. Okay, um, my voice is running out. Um, if you want more information, you can go to my website. There's a lot of information there, brookspriceaction.com. And I'm going to take questions in a moment. Um, I'm going to turn my mic off and go get uh, another glass of water. I've been talking all day, and I've been talking in here for 90 minutes, and uh, I drank all my water, so I'll be back in about a minute. All right. Thanks, Al. All right, so why, while Al is getting some water, uh, if anyone has questions, go ahead and type them now. We'll do our best to get everyone's questions answered in just a few minutes. And also remember to uh, stay tuned to the very end of the webinar when we're done with the Q&A. We're going to give away 10 books through the uh, quiz questions. Um, okay, I'm back. All right, Al. Uh, so I've got, uh, well, thank you, first of all, for the presentation. I thought it was terrific. I've got uh, just a few questions of my own, and then I'll read some questions from the audience. So my first question is, do you have any plans for book number five? And if so, what topic do you believe that you'll talk about? Um, you know, to, well, to, that's funny that you ask. I've already written book number five, but um, it has nothing to do with trading. It's a, a, a novel. And <clears throat> I'm... Uh, it's, it's finished, and I'm, I'm just trying to deal with agents to, uh, uh, to get it published. <coughs> and then beyond that, as far as trading goes, if I do another trading book, uh, it'll be entirely on um, you know, the kinds of things that I talked about today. Um, you know, if, if the market's in a, a channel, this is diff the different ways to enter, and 
um, and the different ways to place stops. If the market's in the spike phase of a, a trend, um, here are examples of different ways to enter and different places to place stops. If the market's in a trading range, uh, here's how to enter, here's how to place stops. And also, you know, where you should be thinking about taking profits. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So if I ever do another book, it'll be specifically about that. All right, so uh, second question I have personally is, do you have any set goal in mind for when you personally, you know, you may stop trading, or do you kind of view yourself as, as always, you know, you know going to keep trading as long as you're able to? Yeah, I, you know, um, I, I, I get really bored. Uh, I get bored very easily, very uh, restless, and you know, I, I, I'll always work. And I'll, I, at this point, I'm assuming I'll, I'll just keep trading forever. Um, I know several guys in their 70s who have traded, uh, you know, for 50 years. And um, you know, one of the guys is very wealthy, and I asked him, you know, why, you know, what, why do you keep trading? He said, because I like it more than anything, anything else. And if I stop trading, I'll, I'll not be doing the thing that I like the most. So um, I suspect that I'll end up um, like one of those guys. So I think I'll probably trade forever. You know, I have enough time <laughs> on, on weekends and in the afternoons to do other things. And also when I travel, uh, I still run my chat room from uh, hotel rooms or from houses if I'm visiting friends. And uh, one of the reasons I live in the Sacramento area is uh, – you know, I go to Tahoe a lot. I've been to Tahoe probably four times in the past five weeks. And it's, you know, 90 miles away. San Francisco is 100 miles away. Napa is 75 miles away. So the things that I like to do are uh, close. Plus, Sacramento is really boring, uh, which is perfect for me because um, I don't want the stimulation. I want to be able to turn off the stimulation. You know, when I lived in uh, West Los Angeles, Santa Monica, uh, you couldn't escape the stimulation. You know, there's just too much happening all, all around. Um, Mike, do you have any other okay. questions? Or yeah, pop yeah. The, uh, uh, I've got a few. I've got three myself, and then there's however many that you feel like answering from the out, the audience. Uh, my next question is, how do you think that your trading has evolved over the last several years? Well, it really has not evolved much over the past several years. Um, you know, it, I, I pretty much changed you know, 10 or 12 years ago, what I was doing. And, uh, you know, well, I, I should take that back. There's one thing I do that's very different from what I used to do. Uh, maybe, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, I used to uh, just ex uh, do extreme scalping all day long, you know, taking about 40 trades a day. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I don't have the energy to do that anymore. Um, you know, also, the, the focus, you have to be, um, you know, I, I do watch every tick, but, you know, I'm just too slow, you know, now that I'm 60. You know, I just don't, I just don't have the physical ability to do uh, that kind of trading. So I do still take a lot of extreme scalps, but um, I don't take 40 a day anymore. You know, now on an average day, I might take 10 to 15 trades. A lot of days, at the end of the day, I'll think, oh, I didn't take many trades, and I'll look back and I find that I took 11 or you know, 14 trades. So a lot of times I take right. trades. And at the end of the day, I, I, I feel like I didn't trade much. But if I look uh, I look at my what I've done, I, I got a whole bunch of points. And I, t I actually took far more trades than uh, what I thought. So I, 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 I don't trade as much as I used to every day, but I still probably trade a lot. Uh, what are your thoughts on the methodology that includes like a bar by bar volume analysis, like you know VSA volume spread analysis or Wyckoff trading? And second part of that question is, what do you think about profile traders, like volume profile and market profile? What's what's your thoughts behind those methodologies? You know, I you know, I've tried pretty much everything. Um, you know, I, I uh, 25 years ago, I guess it was about 25 years ago. Uh, I spent several days with Peter, Peter Stottlemyre, uh, the guy who started the uh, market profile stuff. And uh, I came away thinking that it's hiding um, stuff. Everything is basically based upon simple price action. You know, the computers, they're not looking at bar charts for the most part. They're just basically looking at tick charts. And um, I decided that, you know, pretty much everything is within, is contained in price and time. Uh, and volume, I think, a lot of times is misleading. Uh, sometimes if I see a five-minute chart 
that's 10 points tall and has 120,000 contracts on it, you know, then I think it's significant. Uh, on the one-minute chart, every now and then in my room, I'll pop up a one-minute chart to show a tick and volume divergence. <clears throat> a lot of times, at um, significant intraday reversals, um, there will be a volume divergence. Let's say there's a strong bear spike, uh, and then it makes a lower low, and then it makes a third uh, low. A lot of times, there will be a tick divergence. The ticks will be less negative, and the volume will be getting smaller with each uh, spike. And uh, you know, sometimes, um, you know, that that's a reasonable trade. I have a friend I haven't talked with him in I don't know ten years. That's all he does is trade the one-minute chart, looking for tick divergences. Uh, but beyond all of that, you know, if you put up any chart, and um, you can put up any indicator, it doesn't matter, any anything, <clears throat> you'll find several trades a day. And uh, for me, on the five-minute chart. Um, I see maybe 10 to 15 stop entries a day, uh, 20 or so limit order entries a day, um, maybe 5 or 10 market entries a day. So on a five-minute chart, there are 81 bars. On a typical day, I see about 40 um, entries. And uh, I don't take 40 anymore, but I see about 40. And um, so I don't need um, <clears throat> to do anything else. You know, if I'm seeing an entry on every other bar, um, you know, that's more than um, what I possibly would want to trade. Right. So, um, you know, I don't have a problem with um, anyone uh, using any kind of an indicator or any other kind of chart. But for me, um, I'm comfortable doing what I do. I make my living doing what I do, and I'm happy. You know, um, you know. I mean, what could be better? You, you, you know, right. Exactly. You, you love going to work. You love what you're doing, and you're getting paid for it. Um, all right, so here's my here's my last question, and then we'll okay. Here's my last question, then we'll turn things over to the audience and see how many we can answer. Uh, I think that you're probably in a pretty unique, uh, you know, position with a unique perspective. So my question is, what do you think are the most common mistakes that you see rookie traders make? And then on the opposite end of that, what do you think are the most common behaviors? of the veteran traders that you think that they're making, which, you know, causes them to be or helps them to be successful? I think the single most common mistake that traders make is over trading. Um, they see a big breakout, a big spike, and they think there's going to be a second leg up, and they don't look to the left. You always have to look to the left. So you got to make sure that if you're looking at a big spike and you're expecting a second leg up, you're still, you're not within a trading range. Because in a trading range, uh, it's probably just a, uh, a bi-climax, bi-vacuum test of the top of the range. Uh, so what traders a lot of times do is they see the bull spike. They didn't take it. Uh, they see the channel that followed. They didn't take any trades. And now the market is starting to go sideways and small. And they say, now it's finally slowed down, and I'm ready to trade. And they start entering in stops in a tight trading range in a barbed wire pattern, and they, uh, and they get chopped up. So, you know, I think that's probably the single uh, biggest problem, you know, not taking the good trades and taking the easy trades when the market is starting to slow down and pull back and go sideways. And um, they end up <clears throat> entering on stops uh, at a time when traders should only be entering on limit orders, which means at a time when most traders are starting out should not trade. And I think the, the flip side of that is, I think, um, the thing that a successful trader does, every consistently successful trader does, is they have a basket of uh, techniques that they use to enter the market, and they patiently wait until uh, they see a setup that uh, meets their criteria. In other words, they don't overtrade. They don't say, well, gosh, I haven't had a good setup in an hour or two. You know, this one's got, got to be close enough. No, it's, you know, the market never has to do anything. And uh, a lot of times in my room, you know, I'll, I'll go for an hour or more uh, saying, well, oh, this is a setup, but, you know, it's really not, you know, what I want. This is another setup. It's really not what I want. And, um, and usually it's in the middle of the day or the end of the day when I'm starting to get tired and uh, I, I get extra particular. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I'm in this to make money. I don't, I don't ever want to give anything back. <clears throat> and I don't, I don't ever want to... Uh, take uh, a setup that is not exactly what I want. Um, 
you know, if someone is selling you a, a house and they say, or a car, let's say they're selling you a car and they say, I want $20,000 for it. You don't say, okay, here's $20,000. You know, you decide, do I, is, 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 do I want to spend $20,000 for this car? You know, you, you don't take a setup just because the market is offering it. You take a setup because it's a setup that you want. Uh, and it's really hard to, um, to patiently wait for um, what you want. And it's really easy to overtrade and just take whatever reversal that's uh, the market's uh, creating. All right. So for me, that's okay. That's All absolutely right. critical. Don't take. Don't overtrade. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Uh, okay. So switching to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, do you what, what charts or what time frames do you trade from other than five minutes? <laughs> Um, Ninety-nine percent of the minutes of every day, I'm looking at the five-minute chart. Um, sometimes during the day, um, I'll pop up the 60-minute chart or the 15-minute chart, usually to illustrate something. And sometimes I'll, um, if I'm looking, for, let's say the market's in a trading range and it's uh, trying, <coughs> it's testing the top of the range, and um, and it's looking like it could set up a short. Uh, sometimes I'll pop up a three-minute chart or a two-minute chart and take a short. Um, there's a talk that I gave, uh, I think it was earlier this year, um, in New York about breakouts. I don't know if it was this year or last year. And I talk about this in the room. You know, I talked today about how to enter in um, channels. Um, I talked, you know, that last time uh, about how to enter in breakouts. One thing I talk about in the room a lot is um, <clears throat> when the market's in a breakout, let's say it's uh, breaking to the downside strongly, and I'm looking for a way to get in, and it's just going down uh, bar after bar after bar. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, I'm missing this, right? Uh, one, one thing that I do <clears throat> to get in is I look at the one-minute chart, and let's say the one-minute chart has traded down for you know, eight bars without a pullback. So every high is at or below the high of the prior bar, right? Uh, I'll place a limit order at the high of the prior bar. Why is that? Because um, if, if, if the market tries to reverse on the one minute chart, it probably will end up as a bull flag and um, there should be uh, sellers above. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, um, you know, I'll, I'll sell at the high of the prior bar, expecting um, the reversal attempt to fail and for uh, me to be able to get at least a, uh, a scalp out of the trade. Okay. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Was there another part of that? <laughs> no, I think you covered it. Uh, so next one. Minute charts, that's yeah. It. That's all, when, I, when I trade the one minute, that's all. I'm, when I'm trading the one minute, I'm only uh, looking at it in terms of uh, entering with trend in spikes. Uh, betting that the reversal attempts will fail. Sometimes I'll, I'll pop up that uh, tick divergence and volume divergence chart, and rarely I'll take a trade off that. All right, so uh, the next question is, do you ever trade with any type of a daily, weekly, or monthly target? And I also want to add to that, do you ever have or do you use any type of a loss limit? Uh, it's interesting you bring that up. On, on the last day of the month, I always pop up the monthly chart for part of the day uh, to look at where the open of the month is. Uh, for example, on Friday, <clears throat> uh, last day of the week, right? I always want to know where the open of the week is. And uh, last week, going into the end of the day on Friday, uh, the market was um, about four or five points below the open of the week, right? So the open of the week was... Um, in the middle of the day, of the week's range, and um, there, you always have to be thinking: if it opened in the middle of the week and we're reasonably close to it, uh, that's a magnet, and the market will probably try to get back uh, to there at some point during the day. So a lot of times on uh, Fridays, I'll look at the open of the week. A lot of times, um, the last day of the month, I'll look at where the open of the month was, because a lot of times that's a magnet going into the open of the month. On the daily chart, a five-minute chart. Excuse me, on the five-minute chart. At the end of the day, I always pay attention to where the open of the day was because uh, if the market's reasonably close to it, it'll be a magnet in the final hour. But so yes, I I, I do sometimes look at uh, <clears throat> weekly and monthly charts um, 
but mostly for uh, at the end of the at the end of the week, at the end of the month, I want to pay attention to where the um, um, open was. As far as trend lines and measured moves on weekly and monthly charts, uh, I pay less attention to that unless uh, they're also clearly um, uh, apparent on the um, five-minute chart as well. Right. What about you know, weekly, uh, monthly? Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, what about in terms of, of an actual like profit target or a daily stop loss limit? Like if you have a bad day, do you ever say, you know, after I lose X number of ticks, I'm I'm done, I'm not I'm not in tune with the market, or do you ever say, hey, it's Wednesday, I'm already up X number of ticks, I'm gonna take the rest of the week off? No, I never do that. Um, you know, I know I know a lot of people do that and uh, I don't do that. Um, you know, I um, I don't know. It, I'm I'm extremely compulsive. You know, I did eye surgery for a long time, and if I had 20 operations to do, uh, to me, after I've done uh, 14, I don't say, oh, I've done enough, made enough money, I'm gonna take the rest of the day off. You know, to me, my job uh, was to do all 20, and as a trader, um, you know, I see my job as um, to uh, be there and trade all day. Um, I, I I understand why people do that, um, but that's you know. That's not my personality, and I always try to stay in my comfort zone. And I always try to do, um, you know, things that that suit my personality. And uh, you know, being extremely disciplined and extremely compulsive, um, you know, uh, and you know that's that's my nature. So uh, I usually don't break my routines and say, uh, okay, because of this, I'm I'm now going to do something different from what I normally do. Um, right. So that usually, right. Uh, I, I never, I never. If I'm trading that day, I never stop trading, uh, whether you know whether I'm down or up. I just keep doing the same thing all day long. Sometimes, sometimes I take days good. off, not very often, uh, but uh, sometimes I take days off. But yeah, I, I think that's. Uh, I, don't I think know. that's very good advice, and it also goes to the part where you know someone can't simply step in and copy your method because this method that you've created is something that you believe in, something that you understand, something that's well suited to your personality and everyone is different, right? That's right. You, know, you gotta find whatever whatever works for you, that's what you have to do. And you know, to me, I don't care if it's uh, Elliott Wave, I don't care if it's Fibonacci's, I don't care if it's indicators, uh, bands, um, uh, volume charts, tick charts, it doesn't matter to me. Um, you know, whatever whatever suits your personality, that's what you should be using. We have a question. Uh, do you ever trade outside of cash hours? Like, do you ever trade overnight or Sunday night? Um, yeah, sometimes I do. Sometimes I trade um, um, before the market opens on the Globex. Sometimes I trade uh, at night. But I would say on average, um, I would say, you know, once a week, you know, the morning, maybe twice a week in the morning, you know, the hour or two before the market opens. Um, sometimes, um, <clears throat> maybe once a week in the evening, you know, I'll take a trade. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you'll, I'll see something going into the close that um, gives me a lot of confidence that the market is going to do something uh, after uh, the close, after the Globex opens. Uh, so I'll look for it, and when it happens, I'll take the trade. Right. So I know you, that you like to use an EMA twenty. Uh, do you ever? D does that ever prevent you? Like, do you only uh, take longs above the EMA 20 and only shorts below? Or I, I know the answer, so I'm trying to ask, do you think that people that frame the market in that way to where they have this rule that says, I can only long here, I can only short here, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, you know, again, if you can make money on doing whatever you're doing, I don't care what you're doing. If you're making money, you know, I think that's wonderful. Uh, so any, I don't, I don't care if a person has a rule as long as the rule uh, makes money. Uh, for me, you know, as, as you know, um, you know, I, I use, I have all kinds of little tricks that I use with the moving averages, and um, you know, in general, if the market's trending, I try to, and it's above the moving average, I try to take mostly longs. If it's getting very two-sided, channeling or entering a trading range, uh, I'll short even if it's above the moving average. I'll buy even if it's below the moving average. So for me, right. um, I don't have absolutes. In general, if the market's um, trending uh, and finding support at the moving average all day long, um, it, it'll be rare for me to take a, a short unless the unless we're starting to transition into a trading range. 
or uh, the channel is getting pretty broad. Instead, I would rather just buy and uh, take profits um, on longs instead of sell into shorts. I'll, I'll sell out of longs, but uh, less likely to sell into shorts. Okay. So I see a lot of people saying the market is changing. I mean, the market always changes, but but this year more than most, I see people the market saying the market's changing. <laughs> They are blaming uh, high frequency trading more and more for you know running their stops. I see other people saying that volume is drying up, that the markets aren't liquid enough. What what are your thoughts on what's going on and what may continue to happen over the next six months, the next year? How does that affect your trading? Um, I think um, high frequency trading might uh, create small changes. I think um, chart patterns are uh, genetically based. Um, I think everything that you see on the chart is uh, the result of our DNA, and as long as we're the species that we are, um, the chart patterns are going to be, be the same. You know, I've looked at charts from 50 years ago, from 100 years ago, and if you take the date away, um, they look the same as they do today. I do think that the um, high-frequency trading firms um, often um, make signal bars bad so a lot of times the market can be going down, and uh, the last bar was a bear bar, and then all of a sudden the market reverses up. Um, so I think in general, uh, signal bars are less reliable. If you're waiting to buy above a good bull bar or waiting to sell below a good bear bar, <clears throat> I think that the high-frequency trading firms are uh, making you buy higher and sell lower. So. Let's say the market's going down, you think it's going to reverse, and uh, it goes above the high of the prior bar, uh, and the prior bar was a bear bar, and the current bar is a bull bar, and it closes four ticks above the high of the prior bar. Um, you know, you think, oh gosh, I don't want to buy you know, four, uh, way up here. Unfortunately, a lot of times that's what you have to do, and um, I think a lot of times you get these uh, reversals and breakouts, and you end up buying closes or buying um, uh, small pullbacks like on the one minute chart. Uh, higher up than you want to be. So I think a lot of times um, the high frequency trading firms are uh, damaging uh, the signal bars because the reversals are more abrupt, but they can't hide the big picture. Uh, if you've got you know, 20 different firms all buying, uh, you're going to start get a, getting a whole bunch of uh, bull trend bars. And to me, you just buy the bull trend bars. You buy closes, you buy pullbacks. So I think uh, it's it, the high frequency trading firms are making traders like me uh, enter later uh, than I would like, and they often make me miss more trades than I would like because of uh, the signal bars. But the big picture, the trend, the swing, the legs, um, the high frequency trading firms cannot change them at all. One, One firm, firm cannot uh, do anything. Uh, Goldman Gold. Sachs, uh, you can say, well, they're talking about Goldman Sachs as being so powerful. Uh, at any given moment, they're probably 1% of the market, uh, and they can't do anything. Uh, the market only moves if you know, 5 or 10 or 20 firms are doing pretty much the same thing. And they're not doing it uh, uh, as a, uh, in collusion with one another. They're trying to take money from one another. Um, so um, you know, I, don't, you know, I don't think that um, any one firm is, uh, is in control. Uh, I don't right. think any group of firms is in control. Um, you know, they're, they're seeing the same price action as we're seeing, and if enough of them are doing the same thing, uh, if a preponderance of them uh, is buying, uh, we're going to start to see a series of bull trend bars, and they can't hide it. Uh, we'll see the spike, and I, then I start trading like a spike. I start buying closes. Right. Uh, what, what, well, what advice do you have for someone that is consistently profitable on SIM? But every time they go to cash, they lose money. What what role do you believe trading psychology places on the trader? Uh, what tips would you give to someone that's experiencing that uh, that scenario? Uh, for me, um, I think of myself as an extremely honest person. Right? I haven't done simulated trading in ten or fifteen years, but when I did it, I found out that um, I like to lie a lot, and uh, as honest as I am. I found that um, at the end of the day, uh, with my simulated trading, anytime I'd have a loser, uh, I would delete it because I'd have a reason why I would not really take that trade real time. Uh, to me, 
I personally don't like simulated trading, and I think a person should not use simulated trading except for you know, a very short time, and instead they should trade uh, real money <clears throat> because real money um, uh, creates honesty and discipline. And you can say, well, real money, I, gosh, I don't want to lose. Well, trade small, right? Uh, you know, trade uh, something like FAX, FAZ. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice again. Uh, FC, uh, excuse me, XIV, VXX, uh, you know, and, and, or the Qs, uh, or some stocks that are, are not high priced, uh, like Bank of America, or uh, even Citigroup, or Hewlett Packard, uh, Intel, Cisco. There are a whole bunch of stocks that you can trade, and just trade, you know, 100 uh, shares, right? And, right. Uh, you know, it'll force you to get disciplined and to get honest. And uh, you'll say, but I'll lose money. That's right, you will. Uh, but it's, you're, you're paying to learn. It's tuition. Right. And, uh, so anyway, right. so I, I think right. traders should not, if they want to learn how to trade, they've got to get away from simulation. As soon as they have some sense of what they're doing, I think they should trade real money and just expect to lose for a while. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I'm so happy to hear you say that. <laughs> and I, I try to encourage the same thing of just know that you're going to lose money. So start small, start as small as you can. Uh, don't start with futures until, you know, you're profitable trading, like you said, uh, ETFs or stocks or uh, spot forex or basically anything other than futures. Uh, and then you can risk some more money. So I want to go back just just real quick. You, you mentioned something that I found interesting. And I, I have a saying that... Um, that the institutions can't really hide what they're trying to do, right? But in a sense, they can because of all these dark pools and all this new uh, volume that's going into dark pools. Do you have any uh, comments on the dark pool side of things? You know, I, I don't worry about that at all. Um, you know, every now and then they'll talk about that on Fast Money. Uh, every now and then you see an article about it. Uh, I think it's totally irrelevant to uh, to what I do. Um, you know, I, I'm. I keep it pretty simple. I look for spikes, channels, and trading ranges, and um, <clears throat> you know, and I have a way to trade each. And it doesn't matter what any one firm or any ten firms uh, is doing. You know, if I see a spike, I always trade it the same way. If I see a channel, I always trade it the same way. If I see a trading range, I always trade it the same way. And uh, you know, I just don't worry about um, any of any of that stuff, any of the computerized stuff, any of the hidden stuff. Um, to me, I, I, you know, I, I'm making money, right? So, um, right. Okay, you know, so not, you know, they're not uh, they're not impacting me at all. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, I think people are always um, they always want to believe. You know, they they always want uh, a guru to teach them something, tell them to buy this, sell that. Uh, they always want someone to blame. Um, you know, I I really learned how to trade well, but I lost because uh, my broker has bad software. I lost because. Uh, you know, there was some news item. I lost because uh, the dark pools and the high uh, frequency trading firms and the hedge funds are stealing my money. Um, you know, to me, that's, you know, that's, you're just fooling yourself. Uh, to me, uh, trading is simple. Uh, at the end of the day, if your account has more money in it, you did the right thing. If it has less money in it, you made a bunch of mistakes. And right. it's you. It's not, it's not any of these hidden forces. And you don't no, need some other you know, good angel, some other good hidden force uh, to help you make money. You only make, make money, money if you're doing the right thing, and if you're losing money, it's because you are doing the wrong thing. It's not because of, um, you know, all of these things that they talk about on television and in the news. Right. I, I completely agree. Uh, a part of my signature that I make on every single post on the forum says you have to accept responsibility and stop looking elsewhere to explain away you know why you lost, and I, I see that happen all the time. So I, uh, I'm glad that that uh, you're saying something similar, and I hope people will really pay attention to that as great advice. Uh, I'm I'm going to ask one final question, and then I know that you're losing your voice. We're at two hours, so we'll make this the last question, and then when we're done with this, uh, Al's going to step away, but we will uh, continue with the ten quiz questions. All right. So the the last question is Ashley is wanting to know: Can you talk about your option trades? And do you trade options based on hourly, dailies, weeklies? Uh, do you look for reversals? Do you look for similar setups that you do with your futures trades, or do you handle them differently? 
Um, I, I, in, the, in my third of the three books, I talk a lot about that. In general, uh, most days I don't trade options. When I do trade options, I usually trade them based upon the daily chart or the 60-minute chart. Sometimes um, I'll trade them on the five-minute chart. For example, if uh, Goldman Sachs is, uh, has gone up for the past uh, you know, seven or eight bars, uh, I may just go ahead and buy calls and then um, you know, look at it every you know, hour or so. But um, you know, for the most part, I'm uh, trading out because you've got the issue of uh, the bid-ask spread uh, on options. Uh, and plus commissions, you know, it, it adds up. So you, you need more points to make it worthwhile, uh, more ticks to make it worthwhile. And uh, I think it's hard to do it if you're trading the five-minute chart. If you trade the five-minute chart, let's say you buy a, a spider um, option, and the spider goes up a point, uh, you think, oh wow, um, you know, um, the option should go, the call should go up ten cents, and the call goes up three cents, and you say, wait a minute, that's not fair. That's right, it's not fair, but that's, that's reality. Uh, option pricing is not hand-in-hand hand with uh, uh, the underlying, uh, and there are reasons why sometimes um, you, know, you think the option should go up you know, five or six cents and it only goes up uh, two cents. It's because the institutions think that um, you know, the underlying is uh, overdone. So, but anyway, because of those problems, uh, I usually don't trade uh, options on the five-minute chart. Sometimes I do if, I'm, if, if, if I think there are big, big moves. Uh, but for the most part, I'm, uh, I'm trading options based on the 60-minute chart and the daily chart. And if uh, two hours after I enter, uh, I get a big move, like the size of the move I was anticipating, I'll just exit completely and not hold it overnight or hold it for two or three days like I initially planned. Anytime I get an, a gift in options, I take it because uh, options uh, are uh, very good at taking back uh, big open profits. They disappear really, really fast. So if I if I get a big open profit very quickly, I just take it and walk away. Okay. All right. So I uh, we're going to go to the ten quiz questions and give away ten books in just a moment. But first, I wanted to say a big thank you, as always, to Al for his time today. And if you have not checked out the three webinars that he's done previously on BMT, I definitely encourage you to do so. Um, and we'll be sure to have Al back in the coming months uh, to talk about some, some new uh, trades and new setups uh, later this year. All right, so if you guys have more questions or you want to, uh, to join Al's room, it's brookspriceaction.com. You can see it right there on your screen, and you can get a hold of, of Al through his website there. All right, so thank you, Al. Really appreciate your time. All right, I appreciate it, Mike. All right, guys, so yeah, thank you, Al. All right, guys, so give me one second. I'm going to take back control, and we'll handle the quiz questions here. All right. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Okay. All right, guys, so let me just briefly go over it if you aren't familiar with how, with how we do this. Uh, first of all, you need to have a BMT account. So uh, if you're one of the people that wins, then I'm going to ask for your BMT username, so have that ready to go. We're giving away 10 books. Uh, you can only win one book, so if you are a winner, please do not answer any further questions because it just adds to the confusion. Uh, to keep things uh, interesting and fair, the way we handle it is the first correct answer for question number one wins, and then we increment as we go. So like question number five, we're going to look for the fifth correct answer, and by the time we get to question number ten, I'm looking for the tenth correct answer, and we do that in order to keep things fair. All right, guys. First question. What is a weak trend and what is a small trading range? I'm just looking for the, the number next to it there. All right, I need everyone to stop typing, please, and it's going to take me just a minute to find the answer. Uh, the correct answer is 30, which I, I'm just randomly numbering these to try to prevent cheating, uh, channel and pullback. And I'm looking for the first person 
that answered, which is Jerry Douglas. Jerry Douglas, I need your BNT username, please. All right, great. So the answer to that one was channel and pullback. Question two, in a bull channel, where is my stop? All right, guys, uh, stop typing. We already have the answer. Looking for the second person that answered correctly. And the answer is uh, 25. It depends on whether the trade is a swing or a scalp. And the second person is Frank Zappa. Frank, I need your BMT username, please. Okay. Question three, over time, how do channels evolve? They usually become... All right, guys, uh, stop typing, please, as the answers are flying off my screen. Looking for, uh, so the correct answer is 77, broader and flatter. I'm looking for the third person to answer correctly. So one, two, three. Uh, KJ, KJ, I need your BMT username, please. Okay. Question four, what trading opportunities do channels offer? All right, guys, stop typing, please. We've got the answer. Uh, the answer is item 50. The reward is large relative to the risk. So I'm looking for the fourth person that answered. One, two, three. Uh, Melissa N. Melissa N. I need your BMT username, please. All right, great. Question five. Channels behave more like? All right. Uh, stop typing, please. The correct answer is 10. It depends on the context. I'm looking for the fifth person that answered that correctly. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, Tim Bernard, I need your BMT username, please. All right, going to question six. Which is not true of a strong channel? All right, uh, you can stop typing. We've got the winner. Uh, the correct answer is 38. Since it's in a channel, you can usually trade in both directions. I'm looking for the sixth person there's one, two, three, four, five, and six. Jason Wilson. Jason, I need your BMT username, please. Okay. Question seven. What is common of weak channels? All right, uh, everyone stop stop typing, please. It's really quite a seed. It's uh, to see hundreds of answers flying off your screen here. Uh, the correct answer is both wedge and stairs, so item 33. And I'm looking for the seventh person to answer. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Shake, uh, Ben, get in. 
hope I'm saying that connect correctly. Shake Vinnegan. Need your BMT username, please. Okay. Question eight. What is not true of channels? All right, everyone can stop typing, please. Uh, the correct answer is 77. Probability of success is high. Looking for the eighth person to answer that correctly. Just one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. C. Brown. C. Brown, I need your BMT username, please. Okay, going to question nine. What is the first target of a reversal from breakout of a channel? All right, uh, stop. Everyone stop typing, please. Uh, the correct answer is uh, 68, the opposite side of the channel. Looking for the ninth person. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, Philip Fox, Philip Fox, I need your BMT username, please. All right, great. And here's the last one. What are reasonable trades in a strong bull channel? All right, everyone can stop typing, please. Everyone can stop. All right, the correct answer is 15, all of the above. I'm looking for the 10th person. 10th person. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 is Ed Rabin. Ed Rabin, need your BMT username, please. All right, so congratulations to the winners of the 10 books. You guys will be able to choose which of the three newest books that Al has out. I will contact you in a few minutes on the forum. Uh, as a reminder, I will post the webinar recording sometime tomorrow in the usual spot, and you can check the thread on BMT for details and links. All right, guys, thank you very much. I'll see everybody on the forum, and I also want to remind everybody to uh, be here on Saturday, June 30th. Uh, Jack Schwager, the author of the Market Wizard series of books, will be here for the final uh, webinar for our three-year anniversary on Saturday. Thanks, guys.